Be sure to follow this ministry on BitChute and Rumble because this channel could disappear any day. Don't forget to subscribe. Also, if you haven't already, subscribe to my YouTube backup channel. Links are in the description box and in my pinned comment below. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963. Thank you all so much for your prayers and support. God bless. Welcome to the Watchman channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Were giants mentioned in the Bible? Giants are mentioned in the Bible in several places. Genesis 6-4 There were giants on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men, who were of old, men of renown. Joshua 12-4 the other king was Og, king of Bashan, and his territory, who was of the remnant of the giants, who dwelt at Ashroth and at Edrei. 2 Samuel 21, 15-22 When the Philistines were at war again with Israel, David and his servants with him went down and fought against the Philistines, and David grew faint. Then Ishbi Benob, who was one of the sons of the giant, the weight of whose bronze spear was three hundred shekels, who was bearing a new sword, thought he could kill David. But Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, came to his aid, and struck the Philistine, and killed him. Then the men of David swore to him, saying, You shall go out no more with us to battle, lest you quench the lamp of Israel. Now it happened afterward, that there was again a battle with the Philistines at Gob. Then Sibichai, the Hushathite, killed Saph, was one of the sons of the giant. Again, there was war at Gob with the Philistines, where Elhanan, the son of Jair, Oregon, the Bethlehemite, killed the brother of Goliath, the Gittite. The shaft of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. Yet again, there was war at Gath, where there was a man of great stature, who had six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot, 24 in number, and he also was born to the giant. So when he defied Israel, Jonathan, the son of Shemiah, David's brother, killed him. These four were born to the giant in Gath, and fell by the hand of David and by the hand of his servants. 1 Samuel 17, 4-7 And a champion went out from the camp of the Philistines named Goliath, from Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span, which is approximately nine feet nine inches. He had a bronze helmet on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze, which is approximately 125 pounds. And he had bronze armor on his legs and a bronze javelin between his shoulders. Now the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his iron spearhead weighed 600 shekels, which is approximately 17 pounds, and a shield bearer went before him. Numbers 13.33 There we saw the giants, the descendants of Anak came from the giants, and we were like grasshoppers in our own sight, and so we were in their sight. Deuteronomy 3.11 For only Og, king of Bashan, remained of the remnant of the giants. Indeed, his bedstead was an iron bedstead. Is it not in Rabbah of the people of Ammon? Nine cubits is its length, and four cubits its width, according to the standard cubit. It is estimated that King Og's bed was 15 feet 6 inches long by 6 feet 10 inches wide. King Og was probably a little shorter than his bed, which would make him roughly 15 feet tall. He would probably have weighed around 3,125 pounds. King Og would be able to lift two 1,500 pound horses, one under each arm, or a mid-sized car. He would have consumed 22,657 calories per day just to stay alive, not including calories needed for daily activities. That would be 12 12-inch 12 pizzas or 63 cheeseburgers daily, or one lamb every two days just to stay alive. Being a warrior, he might have consumed the equivalent of over 30 pizzas or 150 cheeseburgers 
or two lambs a day. The giants were a group of mysterious beings of unusually large size and strength who lived both before and after the flood. The Hebrew word Nephilim is sometimes directly translated as giants or taken to mean the fallen ones. From the Hebrew word Nephal, which means to fall. The Bible clearly teaches that giants existed in the past. Many of them lived in and around the land of Canaan, and Joshua and Caleb were involved in battle with them. David and his mighty men battled and killed some Philistine giants as well. The accounts of giants in the Bible are more than just tall tales. These enormous people truly existed, and no amount of scoffing or rationalizing by the skeptics will change that fact. Jesus said he would return when our days parallel the days of Noah, as we read in Matthew 24, 37 through 39. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. To find out what parallels our days with the days of Noah, we need to go back to the book of Genesis. Genesis 6, 1 and 2. Now it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. Who were the sons of God who took wives for themselves of all whom they chose? We find the answer in the book of Job. Job 1.6 Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. Job 2.1 Again there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. The sons of God in Genesis 6-2 are fallen angels, who married and produced offspring with human women, in order to try and destroy humanity by preventing the Savior Jesus Christ from being born. Genesis 6-4 There were giants on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men, who were of old, men of renown. Who were the giants that the daughters of men bore to the sons of God? The giants were half-human, half-fallen angel hybrids known as the Nephilim. Just as in the days of Noah when fallen angels mated with human women and the result was a half-angel, half-human hybrid known as the Nephilim, many end-time scholars today believe Jesus will return when human genome is again being tampered with. Are we seeing any signs of genetic tampering in humans today? Human chimera is living among us. It's only science fiction for right now. Yesterday, the Senate passed the Endless Frontier Act, a bill that commits nearly $250 billion to promote emerging technologies so that America can keep pace with Chinese innovation. Back in May, Democrats shot down an important amendment outlawing U.S. participation in research that would create human-animal hybrids, also known as chimeras. China's already doing it announcing in April that an international team successfully grew human monkey embryos and sustained them for 20 days in a lab. The only question is, what will they do next? Currently, the National Institutes of Health has banned U.S. funding for chimeric research, but that ban could very well be lifted, and who's to say that these agencies will play by the rules anyway? Remember, President Obama banned uh, funding for gain-of-function research back in 2014, but New York uh, AD found a way around it. Uh, and uh, they laundered, it's the NIAD group, and they laundered hundreds of thousands of dollars to the Wuhan Institute of Virology through a nonprofit group called the Echo Health Alliance. The rest is history. Chimeric research is a Pandora's box, that's obviously from hell, that should not be opened. But the scientific community, spurred on by their own hubris, may very well open it using American taxpayer dollars. And if that happens, the Democrats will have blood on their hands for not joining the GOP and stopping it when they had a chance. Joining me now for a reaction, I don't even believe, Laura Logan, here we are, it's the 21st century, we're two very smart women, we have to talk about chimeras and how we, maybe the government might do it. Uh, you've been very involved in great, your research and stories and coverage on uh, certainly COVID, uh, what's been happening there. Uh, can, give me your take on the seriousness of this, China's doing it, and what we have to be aware of. 
You know, Tammy, one of the things that I that strikes me the most about this story is there's an old adage, you know, be careful of what you don't know. And that has never been more true than with this subject. What exactly do we not know here about how far, how, uh, what is the level of involvement the U.S. has had in any kind of research like this? And what else has the NIH and other divisions of the NIH been involved in? Because when it comes to uh, Dr. Fauci and what we know about COVID, we're just beginning to find out, right? We're at the tip of the iceberg in terms of uncovering what was really going on with gain-of-function research. And the whole sort of smokescreen of the Wuhan lab mm. really obscures the fact that Dr. Fauci and the NIH through NIAID mm -hmm. had been funding gain-of-function research for years. And there's a lot of money that's missing here. And there's another U.S. agency that's missing from this equation. It's called DARPA, you know, which is the Defense Research Agency. Agency. So what were DARPA and Dr. Fauci and the NIH doing with gain of function and various other programs like this one, um, which we know so little about? And this is really the moment now for a reckoning. This is time for the American people to start paying attention to these bills that pass through Congress, that get banned, that get unbanned, that get circumvented, and for us to start um, asking for real accountability. Because what we've seen is that the coronavirus, you know, that spread all over the world and caused such panic and still causes such hysteria in so many quarters? Well, you just speak to someone like an oncologist who deals with bone marrow cancer. They'll tell you that they've been identifying hundreds of coronaviruses for years and years. And so this is one of many subjects that we know very, very little about. And every day that goes by, we get the mm. stench of manipulation and dishonesty is growing stronger. Yeah, and I think this is part of what allows us to find this information out. You know, there's the theory that ignorance is bliss, right? And yes, uh, not being aware of things yeah. is kind of peaceful. But the fact of the matter is, <laughs> these things happen anyway. And this particular bill, and this is what Congress tends to do, uh, was about trying to, you know, keep up with China. But then it became a, tr a Christmas tree. It, it, it was like over 200 mm. amendments. And all the lobbyists got in because, of course, it's going to have to pass. So get in whatever it is you want. Mm. And this is what they do without any consideration about the impact on the average person. You know, COVID is, is one thing, right? Mass death. Here you're talking about changing the nature of life. And this is what, of course, is, is so shocking to me. We've got just a couple of seconds left, but this is a real game changer. It is. And you know what's so interesting about it to me, Tammy? I'm not particularly religious, but what it keeps reminding you of, we can create robots that mimic humans. Now we want to take animals and humans and blend them. And we also want to take meat and we want to grow uh, some version of food this is in all a laboratory kind of from the cells of meat. But you know what we can't do? We can't create life. We as human beings don't create life. And no amount of ingenuity yeah. and science is going to change that. There was a time in the Old Testament where the Jewish people were doing what was right in their own eyes, as we read in Judges 17.6. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. The book of Genesis tells us there was a time when God had to intervene because society had reached a point where there was nothing mankind couldn't do, as we read in Genesis 11.1-9. Now the whole earth had one language and one speech, and it came to pass as they journeyed from the east, that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. Then they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had brick for stone, and they had asphalt for mortar. And they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city, and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city, and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, Indeed the people are one, and they all have one language, and this is what they begin to do. Now nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. Come, let us go down, and there confuse their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth, and they ceased building the city. Therefore its name is called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth. And from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. God punished the nations by confounding their languages so they couldn't communicate. Have we reached the point in time where God says, Indeed, the people are one, and they all have one language, and this is what they begin to do. Now nothing that they propose to do 
will be withheld from them. Is God about to intervene once again? Is Jesus Christ on the verge of returning? Stay tuned as we watch Bible prophecy unfold right before our very eyes. Jesus said, as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, there would be an increase in deception, false Christ who will deceive many, wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, Christian persecution, apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. From natural phenomena to cyber hacks like the massive solar winds operation and recent attack to the colonial gas pipeline, security experts warn it's clear that most businesses and key infrastructure like power grids across this country are woefully unprepared to meet such threats. They went after our gas and they went after our hot dogs. No one is out of bounds here. Everyone is in play. Lawmakers like Senator Bob Hall of Texas also worry that means hackers could be just a few keystrokes away from turning the lights out in cities around our country. We are certainly vulnerable across the board to uh, natural and man-made threats to our electrical grid system that could render it unrepairable in our lifetime. Paul tells CBN News that he's especially concerned about an electronic magnetic pulse or EMP attack against the grid. It entails a simply one uh, small nuclear weapon uh, being detonated above the central part of the United States over Nebraska, Kansas area would put out a uh, create a pulse from coast to coast and border to border that would totally annihilate our electric system. Is this really no excuse for the country to be vulnerable to EMP? Dr. Peter Pry, a former CIA intelligence officer, sits on the Department of Homeland Security's EMP task force. He's out with a report this week concluding that North Korea is now in possession of EMP weapons so strong that no electric grid could survive from such an attack. North Korea almost certainly has developed super EMP weapons. These are nuclear weapons that are specialized to produce extraordinarily powerful electromagnetic pulse effects, and it would make it, along with Russia and China, one of the few nations in the world that has these weapons. San Antonio, Texas is now leading the nation's efforts to defend against such electromagnetic threats. In collaboration with the Air Force's Joint Base San Antonio, retired Brigadier General Guy Walsh, along with teams of researchers, scientists and security experts, are studying grid vulnerabilities and deploying measures to protect them from getting fried. For obvious security reasons, Walsh won't divulge specifics, but says their goal is... To really look across the board at training, at education, and the technologies uh, that are going to help make uh, the electrical grid both resilient to attack but able to recover uh, more quickly. Meanwhile, grid operators in some regions of the country are also heeding warnings to prepare for solar storms and sunspots blasting particles into space called coronal mass ejections. William Murtagh's group at the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, maintains a direct line with all the electric companies in the event of a geomagnetic eruption. When we see one of these large eruptions occurring on the sun, and they what we call a coronal mass ejection coming towards Earth, we initiate this hotline call, and we make communication with essentially the entire grid, owners and operators across the nation. Researchers with the U.S. Geological Survey released this map last year showing grid systems in the Midwest and eastern seaboard that are particularly vulnerable to solar storms. Murtaugh says electricity operators are now constantly assessing areas of vulnerability. If there's vulnerability to certain equipment, maybe they can modify that equipment, the manufacturing of that equipment to make it hardened, to make it better protected against the geomagnetic storm. There are many different actions they can take to ensure that the grid stays up and running during these big geomagnetic storms. Still, the big challenge is that many of America's electricity systems 
weren't designed or built with the thought of being protected against cyber threats or EMP attacks. The systems themselves are very antiquated. Um, they're very old. Uh, security is very difficult to do on these types of devices. And we've seen uh, in prior attacks where Russia has infiltrated our power grid from a military preparedness perspective, which means in the event that there is a conflict, could Russia impact our grid? Former NSA hacker David Kennedy tells CBN News that only a few of them are even prepared to handle today's level of hacking sophistication, especially those attacks coming from China. China is very uh, pressing because it, they have a very long-term view. Um, they're very focused on intellectual property theft, uh, as well as their military capabilities from a cyber warfare perspective. I mean, they are they're handing it to us here in the United States from a cyber warfare perspective, and they're definitely scary. All right. Besides the U.S. and Russia, no country has more at stake in tomorrow's summit than Ukraine, which is locked in a seven-year battle with Russian-backed rebels. President Biden has not ruled out letting Ukraine join NATO. CBS's Holly Williams went with Ukraine's president to the front line in that battle. The trenches in Ukraine look like something out of World War I, but this is modern-day Europe, and the fighting's claimed more than 13,000 lives. We hiked through decimated villages with Ukraine's president, Vladimir Zelensky, at one point so close to the enemy, we were told they could hear us. In May, two guys were killed by snipers. The Russian-backed rebel fighters are about 700 yards in that direction. And some say this is the front line in a new Cold War that's brewing between Russia and the US. The war began in 2014 when Vladimir Putin sent troops to seize control of Crimea and backed an armed insurgency in eastern Ukraine. This year, Russia massed an estimated 40,000 troops on Ukraine's border. Why should ordinary Americans care what's happening here in Ukraine? It can be tomorrow, their houses. You're saying if Russia will do this here, I didn't know. it might do it tomorrow in the rest of Why Europe. Why not? Why not? The next day attack America. Why not? I don't know why, why not? That may sound like an exaggeration, but experts say Russian hackers are using Ukraine as a testing ground before employing similar tactics in the US. America's supported Ukraine with money, weapons and training, though President Zelensky's chief of staff told us what Ukraine really wants is America's backing to join NATO. We hope and believe this. Our strategic partners, United States, help us and helps today, now, not tomorrow, not in one year, not in two years, now. In the US, there are fears that NATO membership could ratchet up tensions. President Zelensky argues Ukraine deserves more support from its friends. Turning overseas now to Israel, where Israeli fighter jets struck Hamas targets inside Gaza Tuesday after the terror group launched dozens of incendiary weapons into southern Israel. As Chris Mitchell now reports from Jerusalem, the strikes are the first since the end of last month's war between Hamas and Israel. This video shows Hamas terrorists arming arson balloons aimed at southern Israel and designed to create havoc and destroy crops inside Israel. The balloons ignited over 25 fires, and this map shows the number of fires set in 2021. Israel reportedly warned Hamas the situation will escalate if the balloon attacks do not stop. Hamas launched the balloons to protest the annual flag parade in Jerusalem that retraces the steps Israeli paratroopers took to liberate the city in the 1967 Six-Day War. Before the march, Hamas called for a day of rage and warned Israel to stop the event or risk another war. Despite Hamas's threats, the march proceeded but officials did alter the route so it wouldn't go into the Muslim quarter of the old city. The largely peaceful march included shouts of the people of Israel live, but was also marred by shouts of death to Arabs. New Israeli Foreign Minister Yair Lapid condemned those comments. As a response to the arson balloons, Israeli planes hit Hamas military targets and said it held it responsible for everything that happens inside the Gaza Strip. Israel also deployed Iron Dome anti-missile batteries in the south in case Hamas fired more rockets into Israel. Hamas launched more than 4,000 rockets into Israel last month. John 15, 18 through 20. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you're not of the world, 
but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. I love all of my students, but I will never lie to them regardless of the consequences. I'm a teacher, but I serve God first, and I will not affirm that a biological boy can be a girl and vice versa because it's against my religion, it's lying to a child, it's abuse to a child, and it's sinning against our God. A county in northern Virginia is ground zero for a growing number of national debates on controversial school policies. And now the fate of the Loudoun County Public School teacher's job remains unclear. The school is appealing a judge's order to reinstate Tanner Cross. Cross was put on administrative leave after telling the school board he will not address children by preferred pronouns because it's against his religion. Tanner is back to work for now following a judge's ruling that he was exercising his right to free speech. I had a chance to check in with Tanner and his attorney, Logan Spina, from the Alliance Defending Freedom. You should resume your duties at school immediately, and you have. And now Loudoun County Public Schools is appealing that decision to temporarily reinstate you. Are you surprised they're moving ahead? Um, I'm not surprised um, that they feel that, that they respectfully disagree with the judge's uh, decision in but we also feel like, um, you know, the First Amendment's on our side and uh, the Supreme Court will um, back our circuit court here. You know, Tanner, you're an elementary phys ed teacher. What has all this media attention been like in school for you and your very young students since you've been back? Um, it's pretty much just been normal since I've been back. You know, we're playing t-ball, playing kickball. We're having a blast uh, with the kids. Uh, it's pretty much back to normal. You know, being that your students are so young, has the preferred pronoun issue, you know, even come up with them before you spoke to the school board? You know, be it from a student who has asked you to use one or from a parent asking you to refer to their child in a certain way? No, I, I haven't experienced a parent asking me to call a child a specific pronoun or uh, a student uh, asked me to call them a specific pronoun. So this has never even come up before, even though the school board is, is you know, really pursuing this hard. Yeah, correct. Logan, there are some theories as to why LCPS is fighting you guys so hard on this issue and Tanner staying in school. Right now, there's only a temporary injunction, including talk the school system really wants this case to play out in higher courts. Is this issue really about Tanner causing disruption, do you think, or is this something about something else? It's certainly not about Tanner causing disruption because Tanner's speech did not cause any disruption. And the Loudoun County Circuit Court did an excellent job in recognizing that. Whatever their motive might be in appealing, I'm not gonna speculate as to that, but the simple fact is this. The Loudoun County Circuit Court did an excellent job applying well-settled principles of law to the facts in this case. And we're confident that if the Virginia Supreme Court chooses to review this case, it will ultimately uphold the ruling of the circuit court. You know, Tanner, before you spoke to the school board, you said you were speaking out because God comes first, as well as exercising, as we've discussed, your First Amendment rights. To you as a Christian, what is at stake here? Um, I, like I said, and like you said, Tara, uh, I, I serve God first. I, I don't worry about outcomes. Um, I, I just stand firm on God's word, and I'm just happy to be back um, you know, doing what I do best, and, and that's, uh, you know, making kids healthier through physical activity and having fun. Yeah, Tanner, all this attention, positive and negative, certainly has got to have an impact on your family. How are you guys getting through this? Um, it's It's been stressful, but we pray a lot, and we have a lot of support and love coming from the community, from the country, and from some of my students' parents that support us and support the right to speak freely. One, one quick question to you, Tanner. Maybe you can give me a quick answer. This is just a proposal at the moment, but if this becomes policy, you will constantly find yourselves at odds with school board policy. Can you effectively serve your students as a teacher if you are always at odds with official policy? Oh, I, absolutely. I, I, would, I would call any child uh, by their desired name. I just can't say things that are untrue. Is there such a thing as absolute truth? The unsaved hold the view there is no right or wrong. Therefore, whatever feels or seems right at the time and in that situation is right. Christians hold the view that there are indeed absolute realities 
and standards that define what is true and what is not. To the unsaved, tolerance has become the one cardinal virtue of the postmodern society, the one absolute, and therefore, intolerance is the only evil. Any dogmatic belief, especially a belief in absolute truth, is viewed as intolerance, the ultimate sin to an unbeliever. If there is absolute truth, then there are absolute standards of right and wrong, and we are accountable to those standards. This accountability is what people are really rejecting when they reject absolute truth. The denial of absolute truth and the cultural relativism that comes with it are the logical result of a society that has embraced the theory of evolution as the explanation for life. If evolution is true, then life has no meaning, we have no purpose, and there cannot be any absolute right or wrong. Man is then free to live as he pleases and is accountable to no one for his actions. Yet, no matter how much sinful men deny the existence of God and absolute truth, they still will someday stand before God in judgment. The Bible declares this in Romans 1, 19 through 22, because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. Is there any evidence for the existence of absolute truth? Yes. There is the human conscience, that certain something within us that tells us the world should be a certain way, that some things are right and some things are wrong. Our conscience convinces us there is something wrong with suffering, pain, and evil, and it makes us aware that love, generosity, compassion, and peace are positive things for which we should strive. The Bible describes the role of the human conscience as we read in Romans 2, 14 through 16. For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do the things in the law, these, although not having the law, are a law to themselves, who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and between themselves their thoughts accusing or else excusing them, in the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ, according to my gospel. God has revealed his truth to us through his word, the Bible, knowing absolute truth is only possible through a personal relationship with the one who claims to be the truth, Jesus Christ. Jesus is the only way, the only truth, the only life, and the only path to God. The fact that absolute truth does exist points us to the truth that there is a sovereign God who created the heavens and the earth, and who has revealed himself to mankind in order that we might know him personally through his son, Jesus Christ. That is the absolute truth. The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear, that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. Time is short call upon the name of Jesus today. There is nothing more essential to the world than the gospel of Jesus Christ. In 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4, Paul declares what the gospel is and how important it is to embrace it and share it with others. He reminds the Corinthians of the gospel he preached among them, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures that Christ is coming back for his church someday in the rapture according to the scriptures, as we read in 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 55. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, 
and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? Jesus promised his followers he was going to go and prepare a place for them in his Father's house, where there are many mansions, as we read in John 14, 1-3. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. This is the essence of the gospel, the pure gospel of Jesus Christ, his death on the cross for sinners, his resurrection to everlasting life, and his coming back someday is central to our Christian faith. 1 Corinthians 1.18 For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready!